I just had a conversation with a good friend of mine who's in the process of buying a house right now. And what was interesting is what she said in the text. She said that her friends think she is dumb because they are expecting the market to crash. And here's the thing, she is not alone. These fears are everywhere. I mean, just look at what they're saying on TikTok. The housing market is gonna crash in January, 2024. We're headed for a real estate crash. Two billionaires think the economy's gonna crash in 2024. There's a huge foreclosure market coming. Here are the reasons why the real estate market will crash in 2024. Listen, a lot of these videos have compelling arguments, but are they true? or are they just trying to get clicks and views for their channels? My name is Chris Cruzamano. I am your friendly local neighborhood real estate agent in Southeast Florida. And today we're gonna slice through all the noise and talk about what we can reasonably expect in the 2024 housing market. So I'm here to break down the economic indicators, debunk the myths, and give you the real insights on housing in 2024. If you're thinking about making a move this year, then stick around for this video because we probably have the answers to the questions you're seeking. It's true that the rates have increased and housing affordability has declined, which is why why fears of a crash are rampant. The GDP has soared and the inflation rate has been nose diving, flirting with 3% for months now. In addition to that, home prices rose in the US on average of 27% in the last two years since Q1 of 2021. So everything is looking good. But on the flip side, because the prices of homes have gone up, which in turn means the housing affordability has tanked to an index of 91.4 recently. And that makes sense. When the cost of anything goes up and the interest rates that you use to buy that thing also increase, then things get more expensive. And then in turn, affordability is going to decrease. It's understandable why people fear a crash given these circumstances. Now let's continue on with the previous graph about affordability because it's more than just interest rates and home prices. We also need to talk about income. Let me explain. Now here's the medium income in the United States since January 1st of 1984. And now if we compare it to the medium home prices, we can see that it looks like it's on par with one another. But let's take a closer look. The medium income of January of 1984 was about $57,000 and the medium sales price was about about $78,000. If we put these numbers side by side, we get this. Now let's compare that to today where we get the medium income around $75,000 and the medium home sales price is around $431,000. And this is what that looks like. When we put these side by side, we see an obvious discrepancy between income and home prices. In 1984, it would take just over a year and a half for you to earn the income that it would take to pay off the full price of your house. Today, it would take just under six years. The difference is over 4.25x than it used to be. Now, another factor that people are concerned about is the amount of debt that the American public holds. You can see that it skyrocketed since basically forever. And people argue that this debt is stopping about 20% of Americans from buying a house because their debt to income ratios are too high. In turn, because these buyers aren't buying properties, that means they're not making offers, and that means sellers can't accept the offers and they are saying that that means the market is going to crash. But let's take a little turn in this video and we'll start about the too much debt concern. Is it really a major concern? I don't think so and this is why. If we look at our debt in relation to our GDP, we can see that it is stable and it has even been lowering for the past decade and a half. Further, home ownership rates have consistently been between 63 and 69% as far back as I could find data for. Having 30 to 37% of the US population renting is normal. Therefore, the argument that 20% of Americans can't buy because of the credit doesn't seem to indicate anything other than business as usual. Okay, so what about the homes that are way more expensive in relation to income as they were before? Yes, this is true. However, this doesn't mean a crash is coming. It is the result of supply and demand. The reason why price is climbing in the first place is because the marketplace determined that it should. They wouldn't have appreciated it if no one bought them. People failed to mention how prices got so high. And it's really simple. It's because people bought them for those prices because they wanted to buy them for those prices. No one pays more for anything, including homes, than what they feel like they're gonna get in return for value in exchange for their dollars. No one buys anything unless they think it's worth it. So the argument that prices are too high isn't really valid because it is the direct result of supply and demand in a capitalist society. Nothing more, nothing less. And speaking of appreciation, here's a really good graph showing the appreciation of US homes year by year at an average of 4.92% increase. Yes, we've had a lot of appreciation, but again, that was a direct result of market conditions. And you might be saying, but Chris, what about the trend line? Yes, if we take the trend line of the median US home sales prices since the 60s, we can see at the end of that chart that we blew way past that. And an argument a lot of people say is that this is a clear sign that the market's going to crash in order to get back to that baseline. But that wouldn't be a crash. 
And my thoughts are, yeah, this is unprecedented growth. That's because we just lived through an unprecedented situation called COVID that we hopefully don't have to live through again. We had stimulus checks flood in the market. We had cheap interest rates. We had early retirements. We had a ton of people working from home. All of these things contributed to the massive demand for real estate. A way to look at it is that many people who wanted to move for some time now, all of a sudden found the motivation to do so. And this was elevated in 2023 last year with the gray lock-in with sellers who wanted to sell, simply couldn't, or they decided not to because they had nowhere to go. There weren't a lot of options for them. And even if there were a lot of options, they had interest rates in the current homes that are under 5% and they didn't want to buy a home where the interest rates would be seven, even possibly eight. And there were a lot of sellers thinking that way that weren't putting the properties in the market. So there wasn't a lot of homes for buyers to choose from. All of this reduced the inventory as noted in the graph here. We can see that we had the fewest amount of properties to purchase in the last decade other than during the COVID lockdowns. Because of this, buyers didn't have any homes to buy. And as we know, if there's a lack of inventory, the prices increase or in our case remain relatively steady. I do want to point out one more thing on this graph that you're looking at here. If we look at the far right, which represents today, we can see that even if prices drop by say around 18%, that we still barely get to the trend line. In other words, we have a long way to go for a crash. It's more of a market correction if that even happened at all. So now let's address the mortgage rates. Yes, rates have gone up and that's because inflation rates went through the roof during and following the height of COVID. Interest rates just don't increase on their own. There are people People that make these decisions and good thing that they did because the monetary policy of the current Fed administration has put together what is called an immaculate disinflation. Now an immaculate disinflation is extremely rare. It's a desirable income where inflation decreases without a lot of collateral damage to the economy. And according to noble economist Paul Krugman, he noted that this is exactly what we're experiencing now. And also let's look at the big picture. If we go back all the way through the 1960s, we can see that the current interest rates are relatively fair. And you say that's great, Chris, but what are rates going to do in the future? Well, predicting the future has no guarantees. I don't have a crystal ball, but let's see what the experts are saying, because this is way more productive than looking at random TikTok and YouTube personalities sharing their thoughts and feelings. So Freddie Mac, the NBA, and just about all the economists and data sources are expecting them to dip into the mid sixes next year. I'm going to make my own bold prediction, and I might be shooting myself in the foot here, but I believe since it is an election year in a very close race, I think that we're going to see rates get into the high five range. I'm I'm talking like 5.9, 5.95, something like that. And you might be asking why. There are many people and experts out there such as Double Line, which is an investment research firm that believe that rates have a five in front, then the real estate floodgates are going to open. And they believe this for good reason. Almost 78% of homeowners have an interest rate of under 5%. And there are a lot of people who wanted to sell their house as we discussed earlier, but decided not to. A lot of people feel that the desire to move has been building for quite some time now. So if we combine this emotional sentiment with rate that are close to what a lot of sellers are paying now, this may motivate a bunch of people to jump off the fence and put the house on the market. And the result would be all the FOMO buyers who missed out on the lower rates and were waiting for rates to come down, or all of a sudden seeing their dream homes jump back on the market, meaning they're gonna jump off the fence and make an offer. Okay, so why would this happen during election year? It's because home sales boost the economy and mood of a nation. And based on what I've been paying attention to, this only occurs when rates get into the high fives or, or lower. And there's no better time to think that this will occur than in an election year. And we actually have data to support this. We can go back to previous election years and we can see that the months or even years preceding an election, the interest rates went down. Therefore, we can conclude that one of the two biggest hurdles to unfreeze the market would no longer be a problem. But what about the other problem? What about home prices? What are they going to do? Well, we discussed earlier that home prices used to be just over a year and a half worth of your annual income. And now it's just under six years. This makes homes less affordable than they used to be. But this is the result of a capitalist society where demand demand and prices result from market sentiment. Now we discussed this earlier, but think about it again. If no buyers would pay a price for something, then the sellers would have to drop their price. They wouldn't increase them. So what I'm saying is that even though it is true that housing affordability is down, that doesn't mean that some magical forces were at play. It is simply the result of the supply and demand ratio that happens in our society. And I know, I know, I still haven't answered the question about the future of home prices. What are they going to do? To answer that, I think we got to look back at what happened in 2023. And every single single month last year, the prices have increased. And this is with the low affordability issues that were created by the high rates and prices and low inventory. Prices still went up. Therefore, we can conclude based on all of the data that we have available to us, 
that the prices are likely going to continue in that trajectory. And that especially is gonna happen if the interest rates get in the high 5% range. Now, this isn't just me saying this. Take a look at what NBA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, NAR, and others are predicting. If we average out all of their figures, then we'll have a nationwide increase of home prices by 1.5%. Only Zillow and Realtor.com are predicting that the values go down, but look at those numbers. They're barely worth mentioning. All in all, in 2024, we can reasonably and responsibly conclude that rates will go down, prices will modestly increase, buyers and sellers will likely enter the market and get off the fence, and everything is going to be a-okay. So based on everything that I see here, I think we're going to have an action-packed year in real estate. But again, no one really knows for sure how the market's going to react to these rate changes. We're just going to have to wait and see. All in all, I think we made the point that there are going to be challenges in 2024 real estate market, but it's not all doom and gloom. There's not going to be a crash, at least I don't suspect there to be. So I would say if you're thinking about making a move, then make a move. And if you're thinking about making a move in the Southeast Florida market, well, give the host by Koozie a call. We're always available to talk to you and we're always friendly.